everybody and thank you phil for that uh lovely introduction and for the uh um the, the kind opportunity to come along and uh, and present today i'm uh, really happy to be here uh right with a bit of luck we should now have a slideshow uh so we yes as, see and hear you fine yeah excellent so as phil says uh i'm, I'm talking primarily about how to manage niche b2b ppc campaigns and when when ga4 isn't good enough for you um, so a lot of what I'm going to say today is kind of what you can't use GA4 to do, but I promise I will include some things about what you can do with GA4 as well. The, the good news is there are some really good things that you can do with G GA4, and they're coming during the presentation. So if uh, if you if, bear with me for the first bit, if you're desperate to see some GA4 stuff, I promise you there is. Uh, there are there are some things you can do with GA4, and I will I will come to those as we go through. Um, don't think I'm going to repeat anything about my bio. Uh, so we, we, we're talking about managing PPC campaigns, actually, which is what uh, a huge amount of what I do in my day job in, within the agency. Um, the things I'm going to say also apply to SEO campaigns. They also apply to, to email marketing campaigns, apply to basically any sort of digital uh, activity. And, and some of them that actually apply to, B2, to B2C companies as well. I'm talking specifically about niche B2B because that's what we work in and that brings in some special considerations. It sort of slants a lot of things. But um, I'm hoping that there's, there's things today that will be useful to you, even if you're a, a B2C marketer and never never plan to take an interest in B2B in your entire life. But uh, so if we're, if we're talking about B2B search marketing, you know, maybe we start with something like that, that, that organic search listing that I've got on the screen, or it could be a paid ad. And what we are trying to do as marketers is to persuade people to click on those ads and come through to a nice well-designed website with some good conversion features and then with a bit of luck they're going to engage with that content and they're going to decide that they're you know they're persuaded to engage and they're going to fill in a form and provide their details and then they are going to become a lead and we'd like to know how well all of that activity works because we need to understand whether it's whether it's worthwhile whether it's worth the money it's costing us how we can improve it how we can optimize it so we can use an analytics tool like GA4 to produce a report like this um, I've deliberately kept this. This is kind of slightly abstracted data, so I don't. I'm not. This isn't like a real screen share from a real GA4 configuration, but this is the sort of data that you could configure GA4 to produce, and it's it's a breakdown of um, the different campaigns that I'm running, how much do I spend on them, how many leads did each one of those generate, and what's the the cost of each lead, and that lets me compare those campaigns, and I can make some smart decisions about whether my money's going in the wrong place or not. Um, but there is a there is a big problem with this type of report. Uh, the 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 problem really comes down to a thing. Uh, so uh, the slide says seventy eight percent of people believe made up statistics. Um, Hi John, um, uh, just a quick thing. Can you just press stop screen share and share again? Uh, I think it's it's uh, not sharing your screen for some reason. How strange! Let us. How is that? Are we back. Oh yeah, that's working. Oh, did we miss the previous slides at all? Uh, I think uh, uh, there we go. If you yeah, Ooh. okay, this is working perfectly now. So I'll... excellent, thank you, Phil. So uh, yes, so the the problem with the report that was on the previous slide is um, kind of illustrated by this slide. So so I just made up that seventy eight percent of people make believe made up statistics. Um, so that 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 may or may not be true. Uh, but this is an example of a thing called uh, a cognitive bias, uh, and it's a particular cognitive bias called the illusory truth bias. So a tiny bit of a diversion. Um, if, you, if you ever have a spare half hour and you want to learn something really interesting and useful, I thoroughly commend spending a little bit of time on this Wikipedia page, which is the list of cognitive biases. So cognitive biases are basically all the ways that our minds don't work as they as one might rationally expect them to when we process information, when we make decisions, when we think about things. And there is a, there are a whole load. There's there's a hundred or so cognitive biases listed on this on this article where psychologists have done things to look at, um, you know, how people's brains do funny things. Uh, this is an example of a particular. Uh, this this table is an example of a particular thing called the illusory truth bias, 
and what the illusory truth bias means there's, there's there's sort of two versions of it one is that if you repeat things often enough people believe them so that's good news for people who are in the marketing and advertising industry that if their advertising works we just keep saying the same thing again and eventually somebody thinks it's true but the other version the version that applies to this table is the the, the people are much more likely to believe information if it is easy to process so what I've given you here is like some really easy to process information that says the the you know the generic search UK uh, campaign has generated eight leads. That number eight, really easy to process. That goes straight into your brain as if you were you know like mainlining heroin or something. There's that it bypasses all of your cognitive filters and all of the the the, you know, the question asking systems that you would normally put in place to to filter a fact like that. And you, you believe it and you start acting as if it's true. Um, and unfortunately, this table isn't true at all. It's it's very convincing and compelling. And that's something we have to be really careful about as people who work with data, people who work with, with analytics is uh, that, you know, when we present data to stakeholders, um, because of the illusory truth price, they're going to take it seriously and they're going to use it as a guide to action. Um, uh, but, but if the data isn't true, then that's going to lead to, to bad decisions being made. Where's this data not true um, for for a few reasons, but the first one is kind of a simple one, but it's an important one. That that column that says leads, actually, it isn't the number of leads that have been generated by these campaigns. It's the number of events that have been tracked in GA4. In most cases, that's going to be form fills. In most cases, you'll set yourself up with a trigger to count whether a form has been filled as a result of clicks that have come from that campaign. And that's what you're going to count. It's a nice, easy, well-defined thing to count. Um, but form fills can come from any number of different sources. And if you've ever spent any time on form fill data or you know, looking at the, the actual data that comes in from forms from a real website, especially for a kind of niche B2B website, you will realize they are a very diverse bunch. So they can be they can be from spammers. Hopefully you filter most of those out, but you might but some may get through. They can be your own dev team, your own marketing team testing things. You may be able to filter some of those, but some may get through into your stats. Um, you might see, we see a lot of form fills from people who are looking for jobs. So they want information about your company so they can be well informed at job interviews. We see a lot of form fills from suppliers, people who want to sell you something rather than people who want to buy something from you. Competitors, market researchers, journalists, um, quite often a lot of current clients, if they've got a support issue, they might come through on a form that's really intended as a marketing lead capture form, but they can't find any other way of getting in touch with you. So they come through on that. All of those things will trigger form fill events and be counted by GA4 but they are not the last thing, the thing that you actually want, which is a prospective new client seeking contact with sales. That's a that's a lead. Um, now, in a in a B two B in a B two C company where you're maybe generating you know thousands of, of transactions a day, um, the the first the first ones on here don't necessarily matter all that much because they're swamped out by the real conversions. But in a in a B two B company, a niche B two B company, you know all of these sources can be very important. So I want to introduce you to a couple of characters I'm going to use in the rest of the presentation. So on the on the left there, we've got the unicorn, which is what I'm using to represent the, the actual prospective clients, the people that you really want to engage with, the, the, the good leads. And on the right, I've, I've got the donkey. Nothing against donkeys, by the way. I love donkeys. Uh, if I had a choice um, you know, for, for a Christmas present, I'd probably rather a donkey than a unicorn. Unicorns are quite a nice and then certainly donkeys are very reliable. So um, nothing prejudicial against donkeys, but just for the sake of a label, um, we're gonna we're gonna use we're gonna use the, our friend the donkey for the other types of people who fill forms in. So lots of in, in niche B two B is lots and lots of donkeys. There's not many unicorns, and so when you when you look at the stats from form fills, they are dominated by donkeys. This sort of split, you know, I've got like ten form fills here, eight of them are donkeys, two of them are unicorns. That's not uncommon in campaigns that, that we run, that you might get 10, 20% of your of your form fills are kind of real leads that are, that are valuable to the business. The other, the other eight are, are one, somehow or other in, you know, in different ways, not the people that you're actually looking for. Um, that might sound awful, but but actually it can be fine because because uniform, unicorns are like really valuable. Here are some golden unicorns for you. They are really valuable. I mean, some of our clients' customer lifetime value for them might be in the millions of pounds. So if you spend a few thousand pounds and you know twenty people fill in a fill in a form and only two of them are actually business prospects, but those business prospects are worth a million pounds each, then you're, you know, you're, you're, your advertising is extremely successful. So it doesn't it doesn't matter that there's a lot of donkeys as long as there's some unicorns and the unicorns are valuable. But the the point is that that the kind of 
eight donkeys and two unicorns is not 10 unicorns. Um, so the, the first thing I would say is, uh, you know, if you're gonna take some, some things away from this presentation, if, if you're going to measure, if you're gonna use GA4 or any other tool to measure the number of leads, you need to make some sort of attempt to separate the good ones from the bad ones. That can be complicated to do, but if you don't make it some sort of attempt to do it, then you're gonna be in a certain amount of trouble. Um, if you want to do that within GA4, I should say you don't have to do it in GA4. So this might be a problem that you choose not to tackle in GA4, but that you tackle in a different way, for instance, using your marketing automation system, a system like HubSpot or Constant Contact or something like that. But if you want to tackle it in GA4, you do have an option, which is to upload external data into GA4. Um, this is a little bit complicated. It, it's perfectly doable, but it's technically complicated in terms of GA4 setup. But it's also complicated in another way, which is if I'm gonna if I'm gonna upload some data about whether something's a good lead or not, um, I have to somehow or other actually know whether a, a particular form fill is a good lead or not. And that is not as simple as it sounds. Um, if I look at uh, so for for a B two B sales process, probably you know you if you're a B two B organization, you probably think of your sales and marketing process as having a funnel that is something like this, you know, a few steps like a client realizes that or prospective client realizes that they have a need, they get in touch with us to discuss their need, and then the sales team put a, 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 a proposal together with an ROI calculation, and the client goes through their purchasing process, and then they sign it off, and then we start the implementation, you know, kind of th three or four steps where somebody progresses through a funnel. Um, but, but real B2B buying processes don't look like that. Real B2B buying processes look like this, you know, kind of kind of Sam's the head of a department and they Sam comes to the website and fills a form in. And then uh, Sam's manager says, oh no, you can't buy that. It's much too expensive. We haven't got the budget. Let's get a committee together. And the committee meets up and you know, six other people get involved and they all come to your website and they download your pricing and, and, and use and your white papers. Um, and they have a load of meetings and eventually they decide actually yeah your product probably is quite a good product and we'd like to buy it but then uh the, the cfo gets involved and says no we can't spend anything that's unbudgeted this year because you know we've got a cash freeze because there's other things going on and so the whole project gets kicked into the long grass for six months and then the ceo has lunch with the head of sales and marketing for one of your competitors to have a product that sort of does the same thing that you do, but it's not actually quite as good as your product. And it's lots more expensive, um, but it's got a really fancy, you know, the, 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 the head of sales and marketing has got a really good expense account, a nice restaurant. So the CEO goes to the, goes to Sam's boss and says, I know it's time to, um, you know, they, I, I found out it's great for these, these guys are really good. We've got to get this in. When you're doing an evaluation on this a few, few months ago, you know, you've got to get that. You know, there's, the, there's the scope for cost savings here is enormous. You know, we've got to get this project going again. So Sam's boss goes to Sam and says, get the committee together. And they all go and download and a load of new white papers. And then they have some more meetings and a consultant comes in. And then everything gets put on hold again because there's a there's a there's a reorganization and Sam's boss gets fired, which is a good thing because he was a jerk. And then Sam gets promoted and his like and gets Sam's boss's job. And then one day Sam phones you up and says, Hey, you know that proposal that you sent us 18 months ago? We'd really like to go ahead now. Could you start on Monday? Um, and that's what a real B2B sales process looks like. So in a process like that, you know, is Sam a good lead? Well, kind of yes. Um, but, um, you know, are all those other people, the other 10 people who got involved in the buying process and downloaded your white papers and used your ROI calculator, on, you know, are they good leads? Well, they're from the same organization. And then, you know, Sam was in the system, but then the whole, the, the you know, the deal got kind of killed twice, you know, was that, was that, was that a good lead or not? So, so the B2B buying journey is really, really complicated for, for enterprise sales and what constitutes a good lead and what does not constitute a good lead, what constitutes an incremental lead, not is a really complicated thing to judge. Um, so the second thing I'd like you to keep keep in mind after this talk, if you can, is you know, your, your funnel is not what your B2B buyers are actually doing. It is not the process that they follow. It is a very simplified, idealized abstraction of the true process. It, it might well be a useful simplified and idealized abstraction you know i'm not saying you shouldn't have a funnel it can be incredibly useful but don't fool yourself you know don't let the you know the illusory truth bias get you and think that that's what's really going on in a buying organization it is not b2b buying it's much more complex it involves lots of people lots of touch points very you know chaotic and difficult processes so it's really tough to say yeah this person is a good lead 
what what you often can do is say actually this person's a bad lead you know it's kind of easy to spot donkeys it's not not easy to spot unicorns um but it it can be complicated so when i say you know you've got to you've got to get some sense of lead quality into your evaluation that is not a simple thing to do at an organizational level it's not simple to get that information out of sales and that's fair enough but i would say make some sort of attempt to it if, and if you're if you're going down this journey i would say that the best route is to is to keep it as simple as possible so just say you know look at a form fill is it kind of a good lead you know is it a valid lead has it got contact details does it look like someone who might you know in some way be involved in the buying process that uh you know is relevant for your product just yes or no good or bad lead classify it like that that's a that's a really useful start. You might choose to call that an MQL or an SQL or something else. I'm not going to get any further into that. So um, let's assume you've made some sort of attempt to qualify leads. So the top campaign there, I've got I've got eight form fills, and two of those are valid leads. So now I can calculate a cost per MQL or cost per valid lead, cost per you know potential unicorn. And that gives me a slightly different view of these campaigns. So I'm a little bit nearer to the truth, but I'm still actually quite a long way from the truth, unfortunately, with this data. And another reason why I'm a long way from the truth is there are, you know, people don't have to fill in forms in order to buy things from you. Um, we, like most people, very deliberately include telephone contact details on our landing pages on our websites because web to phone is a really good buying journey. You know, if you're a, if you're a, if you're seriously ready to to buy something chances are you know you want to actually speak to a human being that's kind of the whole point of b2b sales is there are human beings and you can speak and ask ask questions so why not phone and you know you can hopefully you will get you'll get straight into a useful conversation rather than filling in a form and somebody phones you back you know three days later in the middle of a, of a meeting um so you get kind of this this lady on the, the 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 on our background graphic here is sort of an invisible unicorn you know she's come to the website she's ready to buy our product but she's not going to fill the form and she's going to pick the phone up. And so she comes straight through, hopefully manages to actually speak to a human being. That's a whole other story about phone handling. So you, so there are some invisible unicorns that are not recorded by GA4. Um, and you can do something about that. There are various things that you can do about it. One is that you can use um, call tracking systems of one sort. There's one that's built into Google Ads. There are others that are offered by various, um, uh, you know, by various suppliers that will integrate with GA4. This is also a bit hard to do. It usually involves some, some setup complexity and maybe some cost, um, but it can be done. Again, if you're sort of at the beginning of this journey, what I would say is, is don't, don't make call tracking the first thing that you do, but just make some very general attempt to estimate how many leads, how many invisible unicorns you might have, you know, how many people are coming to your site via web to phone and people are responding to your, to your campaigns via web to phone. Just make an estimate or an estimate of it. Um, so, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be exact, but, but if you forget about it, you'll dramatically underestimate the, um, the value, the value of your campaigns. But most of our clients, we find there are at least as many invisible unicorns as there are real unicorns, you know, similar value of inquiries comes from the phone as comes from form fills. So suppose you've done that. So I've got my I've got my form fills. I've qualified them, and then I can estimate how many additional ones I might have missed out because of missing phone calls. And so I can get an estimated total MQLs, and that gives me a, a, a new metric for each campaign, which is how much does does each kind of estimated total MQL cost. So I've I've got a thing which is actually a lot closer to being true. Um, unfortunately, it's still not very helpful. So if you look at those numbers, you know, this is this would be pretty typical for say a month or three months activity. I'm getting some campaigns getting like four or 13 or six MQLs. Um, so again, um, the, 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 the illusory truth bias comes in here. Um, so these statistics aren't made up, they're real, but they're actually not, they're not valid. Uh, they're not a useful basis for decision making. And, and there's another cognitive bias that comes in here as well, which is uh, the bias known as insensitivity to sample size. So if I've got, you know, five or 10 or 15 conversions from one campaign and five or 10 or 15 conversions from another campaign, and maybe those campaigns cost a similar amount of money, I'd really like to know, you know, which of those campaigns is, is the better one. Um, but because those numbers are small, I have a challenge with statistical significance. Now, if you've ever worked on any a B testing, for example, you understand that statistical significance is a is a tricky thing. Um, 
Uh, just as a quick way to to get a handle on it, I, I've just used this tool from um, Survey Maker, quite a handy sort of free online tool that's just on their website. So suppose I had, you know, I've got two campaigns here. One of them, they both generated two thousand clicks. Um, one of them I got twenty conversions. One of them I got ten conversions. Which of those two campaigns is the better campaign? I, actually, I really can't tell from those numbers. I, I could have a reasonable confidence, sort of 80% confidence that the one with 20 conversions is better than the one with 10 conversions. But there is a pretty significant probability that the one with 10 conversions is at least as good. And it's just had a bad day. It's just been unlucky. This isn't enough conversions to say with statistical confidence that one campaign is better than another. So, so data like this does not really help you um, to... To, to to make decisions about where your marketing budget should go, unfortunately. Um, what we can do with GA that will be very useful um, is to look at um, is to look at the kind of earlier steps before somebody becomes a conversion. So if you I mean if you think about campaigns like this, you know, I had two thousand visitors and that generated twenty conversions. Yeah, it's tough to learn very much from the 20 conversions, but perhaps I could learn something from the, you know, 1,980 people who didn't convert, who didn't fill the form in. That's like 100 times more people. I've got a better chance of learning something from those people. And that this is where GA Ball really does become useful in this type of optimization. Um, there are a couple of really good things in GA4 that I, I haven't actually seen many people give it credit for, but do you remember, you know, do you remember bounce rates in GA3 or Universal Analytics? Do you remember time on page in Universal Analytics? Those were terrible, terrible numbers. They were really, they were, they were incredibly unuseful because of the, the, the very crude way in which they were calculated in, in GA3. Unless you'd done, you know, if you'd done some fancy work in, in Google Tag Manager, you could make UA report a meaningful time on page or a meaningful engagement metric, but you, you know you have to do a lot of work. Most people didn't bother. Those things are built into GA4. It does a really good measure of engagement. It does a measure of engagement duration. So you get you can run reports like this. I said that the GA4 thing here is an actual screen capture from from GA4. You can run a report like this where the last column there is the engagement time per session. And if you look at number six at the bottom there, you know there's our there's one of our blog articles. People on average spend one minute fifty three seconds engaged with that page because they are actually reading the blog articles. That's really good news. The other pages in that list are more sort of navigational pages. The one at the very top, actually, that's a page that's, that they're supposed to engage with, but they don't because we've got a problem with the get a lot of kind of spammy traffic to that page. So although some people do engage, not most people don't. So this sort of metric, these engagement metrics are useful in GA4 and, you know, lots of credit to Google for giving us that. Um, th th this, these, these overall metrics are you know, you kind of have to do them. You have to do reporting on campaigns. You have to try to work out ROI, but they're not in general very useful for day-to-day -day management of PPC campaigns or other, other digital marketing campaigns and relatively low volume niche B2B um, uh, um, uh, situations. Um, now, one way that you can, uh, a way of sort of combining these two themes, uh, suppose we had a magical unicorn factory. How wonderful would that be? So I said, you know, most of the campaigns we run, you end up, you get kind of eight donkeys and two unicorns. So if you look at any kind of aggregate reporting, you know, most reporting in GA4 and other tools aggregates everybody in the campaign together. If you look at any kind of aggregate reporting, um, you're looking at a mixture of unicorns and donkeys. And actually for most B2B campaigns, that mixture will have more donkeys in it than it has unicorns. And you know, one of the problems with donkeys and unicorns is actually their feet are kind of the same. So if you're looking at the, the footprints of a herd of donkeys and unicorns mixed together, you know, those, those footprints are mostly telling you what donkeys do, not telling you very much about what unicorns do. And you can't separate those two things. You know, you, you don't you don't know who's a donkey and who's a unicorn, you know, that they're you know that they're, they're, they're mixed in together. Um, but suppose, you know, if I could give you a magical unicorn factory, then you could run a campaign that that only brought in unicorns. And then you could look at how they behave and you know that you know they, they don't all convert, maybe only 10%, 5%, 2% of them convert. But the but because they you know they're all unicorns, you know when you're looking at their behavior, their aggregate behavior, you're looking at how unicorns behave. That can be really useful for understanding how to optimize the details of your campaigns. So the good news is um, there is a magical unicorn factory, and it's what we call LinkedIn ads. Um, so, uh, so you have to, 
use it correctly. And, you know, I haven't actually seen anything in LinkedIn's own marketing where they offer a, a magical unicorn factory, but that is that is kind of what it is for our purposes. So if you set, if you basically ignore all the best practices that LinkedIn will try to force you to follow and, and having, uh, having, you know, 250,000 people in your audience from all over the world, and instead you design a really niche campaign that is only targeted at the decision makers that are actually relevant for your proposition, Here's an example that we use ringed at the top. There are 2,300 people in this campaign and they're, they're in the right geographic area. They work for the right size of company. They have the right skills and seniorities. They work in the marketing function. You know, these are all, these 2,300 people are 2,300 real human beings who might actually buy our, our products and services as a, as a marketing agency with an office near, near Reading. So they are all in our terms, pretty much all unicorns you know there might be a few people in there that that are you know business development people who've lied about their roles on their profiles or something like that pretty much they are they are potential uh they are potential clients so we run this linkedin campaign and we bring you know a few hundred or a few thousand clicks to a landing page we can analyze those clicks in ga4 or in any other tool and they are they are kind of unicorn tracks they will tell us what real how real prospective clients are engaging with our content so you can absolutely use that with ga4 and you can use um you know the, the measures like engagement and and so on in ga4 to get really useful information about from, from that but uh, actually another thing we like to do with it is um is feed that data into a a screen uh, a screen recording tool we we've a, as an agency we we do a lot of work with microsoft clarity um, which is, if you've not seen it, Microsoft Clarity is kind of like Hotjar or some of the other screen recording tools. The nice thing about Microsoft Clarity is it's free. It has quite good functionality and it's, it's completely free. Um, so we would, so we would, uh, a, a web page or a, a landing page for a B2B campaign would track with Microsoft Clarity. And so here's an example. Here's a heat map from Microsoft Clarity. The, these, the, 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 uh, the data that's gone into this heat map is only from a LinkedIn campaign. So we know everybody in here is a potential unicorn um we're looking at kind of real unicorn behavior rather than spammers and job seekers and people who want to sell us something and all of those other you know hundreds and hundreds of different types of people that might fill forms in that that, uh, that aren't, aren't who we want to talk to and they and the heat map in this case you know one of the really useful things here is it's showing us how much scrolling the unicorn herd is willing to do on average uh, in this particular case, the answer is is not very much. You know, people people are not scrolling down this page very deeply. Uh, at the very bottom there, um, you can see twenty five percent. Only twenty five percent of people got even really to the, um, you know, to the kind of what would be the normal fold on a full sized screen. So that's very helpful information because it not least it tells me anything on this page that's below that twenty five percent point might as well not be there. You know, if I've got some lovely video or some uh, testimonial or some other piece of information that might be really persuasive, there's no point having it on page uh, down, down below the fold because nobody is seeing it. It, it. The only way I'm going to get benefit from that from that information is to put it higher up the page. So this sort of data can really help you to optimize uh, landing pages, to optimize other aspects of campaigns. But it's only valid because I've connected it to the magical unicorn factory. You know, there's no, I, I, I can't make these sorts of decisions based on information about how, how donkeys behave because donkeys aren't the people I need to persuade to buy my product. I've got to have, got to, got to know that I'm looking at unicorns. When I'm um, so, kind of my final takeaway really is if you're the, the, the way that you, you can use tools like GA4, like Microsoft Clarity, other analytics tools to, to really learn and improve about. B2B digital marketing campaigns is to segment your campaigns, you know, pull out campaigns where you know something about the, the traffic, uh, and then and then you can analyze those. Don't, don't look at just an aggregate that says, here's all of my search marketing together, or here's all my paid media together. You know, it will not really tell you anything very useful uh, about how any of those campaigns are performing. Um, so I'm pretty much done just to uh, just to kind of recap on some of the key points, and then I'll I'll stop for questions. Um, so I, I hope I've warned you about the illusory truth bias it's something we need to think about a lot in all of our work as analysts um there is a huge difference between you know how you think of your of your sales and marketing funnel and the real journey that your buyers are going through this is true for b2c really it's not unique to b2b but the, the, you know b2b buying journeys are very very complicated because they involve multiple people 
um, and the, the, the role that each person plays in the buying process can, can change over time before the you know before the buying journey is completed. But you know you, your funnel is a simplified me mental model that might well be useful to your marketing team. And you know by all means have a funnel and use it, but it, it does not reflect your users, your, your real users' buyer journey. Um, if you're going to do any kind of reporting on lead generation activity, you, you really do have to try to make some attempt to score or qualify your form fills if you're just counting form fills. It's, it's very, it's a very dangerous way to um, to, to, to try to, to optimize something. Um, don't, don't forget about web to phone. You should be if you're a B two B company and you're not seeing a load of web to, fo to phone leads, you're doing something wrong because it's a, it's one of the best ways to get leads. Um, but they won't appear on your form fills. So don't, don't forget they're there. Those invisible unicorns can be really valuable. Um, thank you very much, Google, for giving us the engagement metrics in GA4, which have replaced you know, completely useless and misleading um, bounce rate and time on page numbers in GA3. They're really good. They're built in a standard down to fancy, and uh, they're great for this type of campaign analysis. Um, when you, if you work in B two B, a niche B two B company, and you do all of these things right, I'm afraid you're still going to end up with with small number statistics, and that's going to limit your ability to make decisions. Um, you can you can see you can learn more about individual campaigns if you segment them and analyze them in ways that are mindful of the type of traffic. You know how many unicorns, how many uh, how many donkeys you might have in them. And my my final point really is, you know, GA four is is very helpful as part of B two B campaign management. We use it all the time. But it can't be the only guide. You know that that, that the, those tables that I've been showing of how, ma how much cost and how many leads are generated, you know, they they don't tell you enough about the performance of your campaigns and the relative performance of your campaigns to be able to make to be the only thing that you use in your decision making process about your B two B campaigns. You have to bring in other information, other sources as well. Um, but absolutely, do use G four GA four, and it, and it and it is a it's a valuable part of your toolkit, but it really can't be the only part. And if you're on a if you're on a quest to make GA4 your one and only B two B reporting tool, uh, or your one and only B two B campaign management tool, you know you're gonna you're gonna end in disappointment. I'm afraid. Um, that is everything from me. There is my uh, that QR code or that link will get you to my LinkedIn profile, and there's my email address. Uh, love to hear from anyone who has uh, questions or wants to dive more deeply into any of the things that we've talked about. And Phil, I don't know. I'm going to I'm going to hand back to you. I don't know if we've got time. I'm hoping I'm sort of roughly on time. If we might have time for one or two questions. Yes, we've got uh, six minutes, so so we're okay. Uh, I've um uh, I've got a, a kind of um uh, an important question, but but one that um kind of often gets kind of overlooked. Uh, so uh, in in some of those uh, reports that you're showing. Um, I noticed you sort of split out uh, brand and generic mm. search and campaigns. What um, what's the reason for that? Yeah, that's a that's a good observation. So if I just flick back to find one for a second, uh, so the, yeah, I sort of deliberately put those those like brand search UK and brand search US at the at the bottom there as a as a bit of a provocation. So thank you for thank you for spotting. <laughs> so it's like in 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 paid search. For B2B, we would nearly always do brand search. So in other words, a paid campaign where the search term is the keyword is the brand name of the of the of the client or the product or service that's being tested. People sometimes say, well, why do you do that? Because we probably position one on natural search anyway. We do that so that we can put really, really good marketing messages onto the onto the SERP uh, in position one that you know dominate that whole SERP. Um, so that we can, so people that are that know something about the brand can be, you know, strongly influenced by our our, our brand messages. Um, they normally don't cost very much. I mean, the, the numbers that I'm showing here are kind of fairly typical of of the split of of cost. You know, you might spend a few thousand pounds a month on generic search and a few hundred pounds a month, even that if that on brand search. Uh, but they, they they're performing a very different purpose. So you, you know, if you think back to that, um, I'm not going to skip all the way back to it. But you think if you think back to that horrendously complicated B two B buying journey you know generic search is at the very beginning it's it's like sam who knows that there's a problem to be solved but doesn't know how to get a solution and goes and goes to google and says how do i solve this complicated problem in my business whereas brand search is only for people who already know who you are you know they're typing your brand name it's they must know who you are so they're they're later in the in the buying journey one way or another 
there might be all sorts of different reasons why they're getting in touch with you, but they're getting in touch with you for, for some different reason. So uh, those those two, although those, those are both search marketing campaigns, they are fulfilling a very different marketing task. And the, the way I would evaluate them is very different. You know, I, I'm, you, you're always going to get loads of conversions from your brand search because it basically just steals all the conversions that all of your other online and offline activities generate. You know, you kind of you kind of advertise on the side of buses and somebody goes to Google and searches for your, back, your, your brand name and comes through as a conversion on a brand campaign. It, it, brand, it, it doesn't mean the brand campaign is the only, you know, it, it shows that the brand campaign matters. It's not a good way to, um, it doesn't mean the brand campaign is, you know, 100 times more effective than your generic search campaign. It just means it, it's it's lower in the funnel. It's people that you're already in contact with, and it's reinforcing their buying journey rather than getting them in as uh, for starters. But it's really, if you do nothing else, you know, I said, like, segment your campaigns. If you do nothing else with your, with your segmentation, the very least you should do is split out brand search from everything else because they have completely different characteristics you should be evaluating them completely yeah you know, i've seen some agencies blend ways. brand and generic and then especially and, and, like and actually it's it's you know it's distressingly easy to do in google ads these days and one might even argue that google's quite happy that it's distressingly easy to do because it does you know it really flatters the if you get a few brand searches into a generic search campaign suddenly it looks like it's 20 times more cost effective so it, you need to be very very watchful for you know brand searches creeping into generic search it's yeah great question Thank you. uh yeah the um we're just checking on time so um uh we've we're actually uh, we've got the next session in about five minutes, um, but I've put the, your LinkedIn uh, link into chat. So if people want to kind of send you a message directly on there uh, or um, we, we'll add your uh, slides into the feedback form, probably in like 24 hours time. Fantastic. Um, uh, but if people want to kind of access your slides sooner, I suggest they email you directly and I'll ask for them. Please do. Uh, Happy to do that. Okay. Um, uh, and I will put the link to Kumo uh, space into chat. That's the networking kind of lounge, although there's only five minutes between now and then. So um, uh, um, uh, the uh, thank you again for that. And I, I love the uh, uh, the unicorn and donkeys analogy, John. That was like, it's going to make my so day. This, this is why I love doing speaker events like this, because because we only thought of that yesterday when we when we had to we decided that the previous thing we had was a bit politically incorrect so uh but yes it's 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 really helpful isn't it so uh yeah thank you and and it's funny that the that it doesn't surprise me that linkedin default to kind of like targeting the the donkeys or everyone because mm. obviously they're um um you know trying to uh, uh they don't necessarily want they want to sell clicks not leads so. uh, the, 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 you know everyone wants to sell ad impressions don't they and you know the, 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 but but we'd like to buy what add impressions to potential customers rather than to like everyone else in the universe. So my coworker has shown up the <laughs> last moment of the. Cool. Uh, okay. Uh, is, uh, I must be over time because I've got a smile on my face. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, guys.